So we will start out with the big question that I do think some teachers will be wondering, and that is what is biomimicry? I was waiting for <laughs> to start. <laughs> we have a short description, which is okay. um, studying nature to look for solutions that nature has designed. That's really like that. great. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. A process of looking at natural organisms or um, processes or ecologies, figuring or materials. out mm -hmm. or materials. Yeah. And figuring out what structures and shapes and characteristics they have to do the, to carry out like the function they carry out in the world. And then using what we learn from that to design the systems that we, the new systems that we want to design. Sounds like one of those things where once you see it, you might see it everywhere. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That's like when yeah. you buy a red car and then there's red cars everywhere. Like once you once you start <laughs> yes. looking for those things, they're all over the place. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what is a biomimetic robot? Really a, a robot designed through the process that Kristen just described. So I, I think in terms of our curriculum, it's it's a robot that's inspired by the students um, investigation into biology and into how um, I don't know if you want to go this specific this quickly, but um, we have students study animals that are well adapted for digging. And so in, in our context, a biomimetic robot is a, a robot that's inspired by that um, investigation. And you used one of the magic words, investigation. As, as a teacher, that was something I loved. And it's almost a less scary word for inquiry, because inquiry can be something that students don't always light up when they hear inquiry or research, um, but an investigation, feel, they should, sure. I know, I'm a librarian, that's like the best thing. Um, but if they hear investigation, then then they might be a little more interested. So they're, ta they're learning about the practice of biomimicry and then taking that and using it to design a robot. I think so. And even more than learning about the practice of biomimicry, they're engaging in the first phase of it by investigating animals, like asking, how does this animal do this thing that is really good at doing in the world? So how does this animal, this pangolin dig through dirt and, and soil so well? Mm, let's look at its claws. Let's look at its arms. Let's look how they move and how they're shaped and then take all of that and see if we can apply it to the design of our robot. And any teachers who have not looked through the curriculum yet, there's, I think my favorite part of the curriculum, I'm gonna ask you about yours later, but <laughs> I love where you take that inquiry and design, and then they start looking at the robotic elements that they can incorporate that can mimic um, what it is that the animal does so well. So not only do they have to investigate and learn about the animal, but then you have to apply that information to what you know about robotics and uh, incorporate that into your robot. Mm -hmm. And that actually brings me to my next question. You could have chosen any robot. There are many educational robot and robotics kits on the market. So why BirdBrain and why the Hummingbird kit for this project? That's a fair question. I should have anticipated that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, we thought about this quite a bit before we started the project. Um, one of the things that I really like about the Hummingbird kit is that you can bring your own materials to it. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to have students use craft materials, I think um, craft materials don't feel intimidating at all. They're pretty familiar to most people. And so I liked that we'd have a really wide range of materials to work with, anything that we want to um, to bring to the project, the kit could kind of accommodate. Did you find that most of the kids worked pretty well with the hummingbird kit, that it helped them get where they needed to go? I think so. That's always good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I got, uh -huh. Oh, I'm so glad. Um, I got excited and skipped ahead a little bit. I <laughs> wanted to ask, where did the idea for the bio robot curriculum come from? How did that, how did the seed get planted for you? Well, there was a roboticist and a biologist, and they met in a bar. And <laughs> <laughs> That's how great love stories begin, right? <laughs> they might have met in an office at Tufts, actually. Yeah, it was less exciting bar. love stories. But... <laughs> 
No, it's just that around here, um, there are a lot of firms that are exploring biomimetic robots. And so it was a cool new cutting edge of, of, of science. And so it just, it, I, I'm, you know, it was an inspiration to all of us to see these, uh, um, what do they call this spot, which is a little dog type robot. And there, there are a whole bunch of them. You must have seen them, Sarah, from, uh, Boston Dynamics. Like the Boston Dynamics robots? I bet I have, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, engineers are having fun with this and, you know, making great strides. Why not have um, middle schoolers have the same fun? So. Oh, I love that thought process of the fact that so much ground is being covered and there are a lot of really cool careers and research going on. And so you thought, let's give kids a head start and uh, you know if you've worked with kids you know that they are some of the most creative minds out there exactly so yeah if you get them started thinking about it early imagine yeah. what these young roboticists and biologists and engineers that you've inspired will be creating by the time they're working in those labs yeah and you know the the um, animals that we feature in the curriculum there are only four of them but the creates you just see that creativity when mm -hmm. kids when you look across the range of solutions that they've come up with it's pretty amazing uh, yeah. how many solutions there are so now i have to ask you which animals you chose and how you narrowed it down because their kids love animals and love such a wide range of animals how did you choose the four that you were going to focus on I guess we were looking for different digging mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up with ones that scratch, um, ones that use their teeth, uh, and ones that swim through the soil. And then the pangolin, which kind of, which has a, it's, you know, it has very adapted claws mm -hmm. for, for digging through hard soil, through ant heaps, actually. So. Um, so those provided what seemed like within the, the narrow constraint of digging, a bunch of different biological solutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very yeah. cool. Originally, we were thinking about creating curriculum materials to build robots to carry out a range of functions that would be helpful in a rescue situation. So we were looking at all sorts of animals that carry out different sorts of motion and do different things to the world around them. So we looked at lots of di different animals, but it was too much to figure out, to mm -hmm. focus in. Like it was, mm -hmm. um, there were too many examples that it made it hard to do a real investigation of one mm -hmm. specific like function in the world. So then we got serious about digging. Okay, now we can really explore digging. How do different animals in different environments move that material? We learned a lot for sure. Oh. And the way you get kids, the way you kind of pull students in with that digging project, I think is so neat. There are, the curriculum is amazing because it combines so many best practices in teaching. You've got your project based and your hands-on learning, the real world connection. They're being kind of hired as consultants and designers for a firm that is helping people that are surviving a natural disaster. So you're grabbing all sorts of learners that are attracted to all sorts of different things. If someone is not particularly inspired by inquiry, it's a real world authentic learning situation. If it's someone who's inspired by helping people, they know that they're creating something that would be helping someone after a natural disaster. I just kept thinking about all of the ways that it would connect to different types of learners. And there are so many topics and standards covered. Um, you on the website, it talks about interdisciplinary learning and how that was something that you really wanted to incorporate into this project. Can you tell me a little bit more about interdisciplinary learning and why you think it works well in the classroom, why it was something that you went for when you were designing? I feel like you can start, Deborah. <laughs> well, we've we've made the I can start with your last question. Why? I think this was your question, why we thought it was important to bring into mm -hmm. the classroom. Um, We've talked a lot about how classes, um, especially in middle school where we're working, usually you learn about science in your science class and you learn about, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have an engineering or technology class in your school, you'll learn about that in your engineering or technology class. But, um, you know, a place like Boston Dynamics that we were just talking about, they're not making those types of distinctions. Everyone's kind of doing all of this reasoning across disciplines, you know, together in order to meet a goal. And so we just thought that was a really nice approach and we wanted to be able to bring that approach um, 
into classrooms. And I'll let Kristen or Julie pick up. Well, there's a lot of research that shows that that's more engaging, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it relates to the real world much more closely. Mm -hmm. And um, that if it's well done, that they learn in all of the disciplines that are mm -hmm. involved. So we also, I think, had a sense that um, different teachers would have different opportunities and challenges in terms of bringing robotics experiences into their classroom and so by creating an interdisciplinary curriculum there could be different entry points for different teachers so a science teacher might feel like oh okay like i understand how to help students analyze structures of animals and think about their functions that can be where i launch into this and then we can all learn the robotics together whereas a technology or engineering teacher might be more comfortable with the coding aspect of it but be excited to learn the new piece of the animal analysis so i don't know that that was our original i don't know it was a piece of the original conversations and it turned out to be important you're also Such excited a thoughtful to... detail <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, oh, sorry gonna... deborah i inter interrupted you with my excitement go ahead no 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 <laughs> We love your excitement. We're very <laughs> pleased about that. Um, I think we also thought about different entry points for the students as well as the oh, teachers yeah. that some students are are similarly either more comfortable or extremely excited about um, having the chance to, to work with the robots and work with the materials or do some programming. And that just kind of gives them a different way into the science or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So it felt very versatile. Yeah. And piece on the other end is the student learning um, of each discipline we hoped would be richer because of what was added by the other disciplines. Just like at Boston yeah. Dynamics, like they build better robots because they bring in scientific ideas and science practices, investigating animals um, and other things in the natural world. The students will learn engineering better if they're bringing science reasoning and science ideas into it and vice versa. So I think we saw the interdisciplinarity as a way to enrich their learning trajectories in each of the domains as well. Mm -hmm. It's a great real world connection because I don't know about you, but in my day, I don't like schedule out the science portion of my day from 10 to 12 and then go into the critical thinking portion of my day from <laughs> one to two. And, and so teaching kids to blend those skills and to kind of have their toolbox ready and pick and choose what they need when they're solving a problem is smart and and a lot of curriculum thinks about that for students but not a lot of curriculum thinks about that for teachers so mm -hmm. i really appreciate that you've given teachers different kind of anchors to stick to because if you're a science teacher and you know you're really good at science mm -hmm. it is hard to jump in with robotics when that's mm -hmm. something that you're not as familiar with and so mm -hmm. giving everybody something to feel like an expert in and Absolutely. then an opportunity to grow that's really thoughtful planning like a lot of teachers will say thank you for that <laughs> and what do you have did you have a certain teacher in mind when you were designing like who is this course for and is there anything specific that teachers need to know before they introduce it to their classes hmm, that's an interesting question we had i think we had sixth through eighth grade in mind we had we knew that um, because of the design that it could be taught in a science class an engineering class uh, we had some out of school um, settings where mm -hmm. where it was used. So uh, we weren't thinking about it, I don't think, as explicitly at the time. But um, but as you pointed out yourself, it you know any teacher with any background can actually take it up and use it. So yeah, I think we maybe had multiple. We were hoping that it would be seem feasible for multiple different kinds of teachers. And we tried to hold those in our minds at the same time, but the common, maybe the common characteristic was an interest in project-based curriculum, I think. Yeah. 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 Someone who's not afraid of a challenge. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> um, do you have any suggestions for teachers that are looking to integrate more inquiry and kind of inquiry-based inquiry, inquiry -based learning, this interdisciplinary learning into their classes. If they're looking at this project and thinking, this is not like anything I've tried before, this is kind of new, um, any tips for them as they get started? I think That's it's a, a big question, sorry. It's a big question. <laughs> well, it's, it's a challenge that anybody who takes up problem-based learning um, is willing to face, is that you won't know everything. Mm -hmm. um, and that if you position yourself as uh, as learning alongside your students, 
you know, that's good pedagogy um, and to relax and let that magic happen, I think. I think one thing our collaborating teachers have said has been helpful in the later years of the project is um, to see multiple examples of the kind of artifacts students create yeah. on their journey through the unit. So if you're looking at the, if a teacher is looking at the curriculum unit, I think sort of taking a peek at the um, final prompts for posters or share outs, the things we suggest doing at the end of the unit and sort of mm -hmm. imagining what your students might do there, not just the robots themselves, but the representation of ideas and trials and test results that can help teachers wrap their heads around mm -hmm. the unit, I think. And I think related to that, there's a lot of different ways for students to represent what they know. So even if the you know, sometimes the final robot doesn't work exactly the way you want it. I feel like Murphy's Law suggests when you put a spotlight on it, it might not work the way you want it, but there's a yeah. lot of different places in the curriculum that students are are explaining what they know, sketching what they know, you know, drawing what they know, building what they know. And so there's just all of these different places that even if any one piece doesn't work perfectly, um, you mm -hmm. still had an opportunity to for the student to engage in a lot of different ways that, that can be you know, that, that they can express what they know. And then the teacher has a lot of different ways to see those. Mm -hmm. And that's so confidence building for mm -hmm. a student. That's like music to my ears at Bird Brain. Our mission is to inspire this deep and joyful learning for all students and not all students learn the same way. Right. And so mm -hmm. you're going to have students that are going to feel so excited that they get to give you a sketch and mm -hmm. some that are living for that trifold poster and some that are going to ask if they can turn theirs into an iMovie. Mm -hmm. And it's so open-ended and there's such authentic opportunities for sharing learning that students all across the spectrum can feel successful and look back and be like, I really nailed that project, um, which is so cool. Absolutely. And I think I have maybe grilled you enough. <laughs> <laughs> I could ask more, but you've given me such great answers. Is there anything that you want teachers to know or anything specific that you hope that they'll get any kind of closing messages that, that I can include? Try it. <laughs> it's a really creative process and there's just a lot of ways to to do it and do it well We're, I kind of hope that we've built in that sense in the curriculum that there's not just one way to kind of get through it so and we want to hear from them anybody who tries oh. it we would love to hear from them about their what's, experience what's the best way for them to reach you um, maybe through the website. What do you think? I'm trying to remember if we put an email on the website. Well, the, to, there's a, to, a general Turk email and the email will get forwarded to one of us if they do, if they email um, the website. I think when they ask for the materials, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. there's a little sign up form um, because Turk is, is collecting info about who's interested in the curriculum. So yeah, they I get your lovely newsletters now because I have gotten the curriculum and I oh. love those too. <laughs> and it, there's a contact page on the website that yep. gives, um, I think Deborah gives your email. Oh, and that's so right. Perfect. It's, it's good. So teachers, if you're, if anyone out there is listening, um, they want to hear from you. So uh, tweet and email and, and, you know, spread the word about this very cool curriculum. <laughs>